We have all board members present. Meeting is called to order. Let's please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. So we'll now move to our student council from Columbia. We have Katie and Ryan. I see both of you. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hi. Oh, so loud and clear. <laughs> we just have a really brief update tonight. So this winter student council, we decided our last meeting, we're going to focus on charitable events. So last week, we sent out a poll for, of different fundraising ideas for members to vote on. And we went over those results at our meeting after school today. And we've decided to focus on raising money for the Make-A-Wish Foundation and to have a collection for local animal, a local animal shelter or the ASPCA. So Ryan is going to explain some of our ideas for those. Thanks, yep, Katie. we're also going to have, or we're, we're discussing having a candy bar or a hot chocolate sale uh, to raise money for those charities. Uh, but we're looking into if we're able to do those with coronavirus restrictions. And Goff just finished up with a food drive, so we are also planning to have one later in the year. Great. Anything else? You guys are doing good? How was virtual exam week? It went well. It went well? <laughs> went well? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I heard positive things, so I think that went, uh, good to be back though, right? Yes. Definitely. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we'll now move to the public forum of our board meeting. Residents, students, employees, and business representatives of the East Greenwich Central School District may address the board on matters concerning programs and or operations of the district other than matters involving personnel. Members of the board do not directly respond to citizen concerns during the public forum. If a response is appropriate, either the president or superintendent will contact the individual in the near future. Those persons wishing to address the board will be recognized by the chair of the meeting and should state for the record their name and address or affiliation with the district or business. While the board does not wish to infringe upon free speech protection, it must be stressed that the visitor's forum is not deemed to be an open forum. The board president will conduct the forum for the orderly and efficient operation of board business. In addition, any remarks which be considered defamatory or stigmatizing are prohibited will be cleared out of order. So as we have during the, uh, the virtual meetings, we have a public email address that is set up for our community members to email us. That email is typically monitored by Ms. Wager. And she, are you logged on? I'm logged in. I'm logged in. And there are, no public comments. there are no public comments at this time. Okay, very good. And the, those members of the public who may be watching the meeting um, can have another opportunity to address the board via email later on uh, during the second public forum. So with that, I will go to the board forum and Superintendent Wart will start with our board members as I see uh, on the screen, then we'll move to the in-person folks. So I'll start with uh, Mark, Mark Mann, you're good. Joanne Taylor, I see you, Joanne, you're good. Kathleen Curtin, thumbs up, thank you. Jennifer Massey, Jennifer's good. And Michelle Skowerski, Michelle, good. And John Dunn, John Dunn's good. All right, and on my right, Deanna, I'm good. you're good. And Frank, good. very good, okay, and I don't have any at this time. A um, lot of agenda items, discussion, a lot of things happening in the district and in the community uh, that we need updates on, so we'll get right down to business, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Simons for the uh, superintendent report. Thank you, Mr. Buno. I wanna welcome members of the community and our members of the board to the uh, public board meeting this evening. We do have a lot of topics to talk about. Uh, we wanted to take an opportunity to provide the community, in particular our board students and parents, with information about what is happening related to a recent announcement that occurred at the state level that our districts are permitted to uh, operate winter sports, including high-risk sports. Up until now, we have only been operating bowling for our girls and our boys on a virtual basis but last friday this past friday evening uh, it was announced that the uh, governor would permit schools to operate what the state has classified as high-risk sports 
such as basketball, wrestling, indoor track, cheerleading, and some sports that East Greenbush currently doesn't offer, such as swimming. The criteria established by the state of New York indicates that the county health departments with jurisdiction within the area of a school district really has the final determination as to whether or not schools would be permitted to do this. So the state's approval is subject to the permission of the county and during the past several days, Mr. Leonard, our athletic director, and myself have been preparing and planning for the operation of sports subject to the approval of the county. There are some challenges and complications related to the way that the state has approved this option for our student athletes. In our district, for example, we compete in the Suburban Council League, and our Suburban Council League is made up of school districts from not just one county, Rensselaer County, but four counties, Schenectady County, Albany County, Saratoga County, and Rensselaer County. And each respective county Department of Health has to approve the operation of high-risk winter sports in order for our league to fully function. So Mr. Leonard has been discussing the planning with the respective athletic directors from each of the districts that compete in the Suburban Council, and I have been in discussions with each of the superintendents of the districts in the Suburban Council about how we would go about operating our sports in the event that those four respective counties approve them. As of this afternoon, at a meeting I had with Rensselaer County Executive Steve McLaughlin and Rensselaer County Health Director Mary Wakunis, the counties have not resolved their differences regarding whether or not they will approve the operation of winter sports and what criteria they would apply to make that determination. So there is this agreement among the counties as to whether this will happen and uh, what criteria will be used to determine uh, that school districts are permitted to proceed with sports. The difficulty that I feel regarding this is as the superintendent, and I'm sure uh, many um, superintendents feel this way, we want to see our students engaged, and we recognize the importance of engagement for our kids, particularly now as we have been dealing with um, higher levels of confinement of our students because of the limited social activities. Uh, and we have only been able to offer one sport this winter, and we are offering virtual extra cl extracurricular clubs, which we believe are important for the students. So. The announcement that sports could happen or might happen, we've got some kids excited about it and some parents are really advocating for it and I would like to see the kids out there. However, this, this determination is, does not solely rest with the superintendent of the district nor our board of education. So we still have some ways to go over the next few days to know whether or not we would be permitted to, to uh, offer winter sports. Uh, there are some differences in views among our county departments of health. They are trying to reconcile those differences. Uh, and uh, we were told this afternoon that there's an ongoing effort to see what could be done as we read different announcements from different areas of the state as to whether or not they're permitting it. In some cases, they are. In other cases, they're not. So as an advocate for the kids, our board, uh, we'll continue to review this matter. Uh, we will be discussing it further this evening. And at this point, I want to ask Mr. Leonard to talk about the work that the Suburban Council athletic directors have been doing really since last Friday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday through today, the athletic directors have been working on this in anticipation of it happening 
and what safety and health protocols would need to be in place. I will say before I introduce Mr. Leonard, our fall season went remarkably well. And I could not have been more proud of our student athletes, our athletic director, Mr. Leonard, our coaches, and our parents of the job that we did in East Greenbush School District of operating our sports programs safe. It was a great reflection on everybody within the community. The difference as we move into today, the infection rate is still higher, and that is causing the counties to have concern, and no one was prepared for this announcement that came on Friday. We were thinking we would get through the, um, the decline that we're experiencing now in the cases that resulted from the holidays, and most of us were thinking about and hopeful that spring sports would occur. So this caught the county by surprise and it caught the, school caught the school districts by surprise and we've been working through it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Leonard to talk about the development of the guidelines that is occurring right now in accordance with what the state is asking us to do regarding the operation of sports. Mr. Leonard. Good evening, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, no, okay. Yep. Um, yeah, it was kind of a bombshell that got dropped uh, six o'clock on uh, or four o'clock last Friday. And seeing that I have the lovely job of being suburban council athletic director president this year, out of all the years, um, I came back up to school Friday night and we had a subcommittee. We worked for a couple hours Friday night, Saturday about six, seven hours, Sunday for about 10 hours and developing guidelines, criteria, um, duties and responsibilities similar to what we did with the fall. I want to chime in what Mr. Simon said. I'm extremely proud of our student athletes, our parents and coaches this fall. We didn't have any issues. A few other suburban schools, you know, struggled a little bit with a couple teams, but we got through the entire season and uh, it's a reflection of what type of people we have. So basically in your packet, you have something called the Suburban Council Return of Interscholastic Athletics Standard Operating Procedures for Winter High Risk Sports 2021. So basically, we take all the documentation from New York State Interim Guidance for Sport and Recreation, from NISFA, which is the New York State Public High School Athletic Association, Return to Scholastic Athletics, and as well as some other guidance we research, receive from NISFA, as well as Section 2. So basically, we put together a kind of a playbook, so to speak, uh, of how our league is going to operate. And I want to, it's very critical that all 15 schools are on the same page. So if we have teams going to Shen, the same expectations, safety protocols and procedures are the same, whether they come to Columbia, you go to Shen, you go to Shaker. So that's very critical for the safety, uh, the continuity of the programs. Um, from this fall, I'm not sure if anybody, you know, we uh, created badges for, you know, two guests, uh, two sp uh, spectators. Uh, we taped our bleachers, we had contact tracers. So it's the same thing here at Columbia as well as other suburban schools. Um, I'm just gonna kind of quickly go through a couple different general considerations. We all use a health screening. So every single day, a student athlete will come to a practice, uh, whether they're an A student or a B student or a fully remote student, believe it or not, can participate in athletics. They will get a, a daily health screening. We have a log, we have a checklist, and they also get a temperature check every single day or ask uh, the similar questions. And those logs are handed in to me after each week. We double check them and we keep them and we file them. So we, we're doing daily health screenings, which I think is very important. Um, some other general considerations, uh, masks are always uh, this winter, uh, except for the, the, the uh, sport of wrestling, uh, and I'll get to wrestling, but masks are required all, at all the time. So for example, if you're playing boys basketball, you are wearing a mask all the time. The only time that you wouldn't be wearing a mask is during the, uh, a play and the mask is knocked off your face, the play will be finished. As soon as the play is finished, uh, the ball is dead, the whistle blows, that athlete will have to put their mask back on. So masks are on and up the entire time. And in the fall, if uh, a student athlete or a parent deemed it was not as tolerable, they had the option of pulling it down and putting it back up. 
Section two just came out that if a student athlete feels that it's not tolerable, they now have to provide a medical uh, documentation uh, and provide that to the school why it's not tolerated. I can tell you this fall, we had a great success of our student athletes listening. I went around numerous times right in the beginning uh, and just told the students, to, if we're gonna have success, you have to wear your masks. It took a couple days, but I was proud to watch cross country meets, soccer games, field hockey, you name it, our kids wore the mask because they realized the success of playing and continue to play uh, was wearing masks. Our coaches did a super great job. And what I like about our winter coaches that 10 of them coach in the fall, so they're familiar with a lot of the procedures. Um, I'm gonna quickly just talk about a couple sports, give some highlights of examples that we came up with. So for example, in basketball, in your basketball, I'm not sure if, uh, it's, I think it's in your packet, but you all, I'm not sure if you see this diagram, but that's the diagram I'll be working off of. So basically, we're almost to the NBA, where instead of having a straight long bench of 15 to 20 chairs side by side, they're gonna be staggered back in rows, six feet apart, going back, going back. Each chair is labeled. So for example, if I'm on the basketball team, I have a chair that is named, it's a, it has a name plate that says Mike Leonard. So if I uh, am in the game, no one's sitting in my chair. If Mr. Simons is on the team and there's a chair that says Jeff Simons, he comes in for me, I can't go sit in Jeff Simons' chair. I have to go report Mike Leonard's chair. In my six by six cube, I have my water and my personal bag belongings. The score table, normally we have the scorekeeper, the announcer, and the two people that take the book, the home book and the uh, away book. We will only have the announcer and the scoreboard person, and then we'll have to set up side tables for each home and away scorekeeper that are six foot away. We will have now an officials table that is behind. The officials used to leave their you know, jackets, their water on the score table. That no longer will be. They'll have their own designated table six feet beyond the score where they can leave their personal items, their water. Also on our score table, because it's that sport, there'll be Clorox wipes, extra masks, because during a basketball game, we found this out in the fall. You know, a lot of kids, um, you know, their masks would break, the string would break. We have individual masks wrapped in baggies that we provided, and it worked out great. So we always have extra masks at practice and at games. So each coach will receive hand sanitizers, big ones, the small little portable hand sanitizers, the temperature gauge, baggies, gloves, um, towels, disinfectant spray. So all those things will be at every game and all those coaches have those things. And we have throughout the athletic wing, there's a ton of hand sanitizer station that, that we've had since the fall. So those are some of the things, particularly like in basketball. In a basketball game, after the first quarter, that basketball is taken out of the game and a new clean basketball is brought into the game. And you would do that after the first quarter, second quarter, halftime, third quarter, and obviously at the end of the game. So you're constantly trying to clean that equipment and turn that over. Uh, so that's just a couple highlights with basketball. Uh, it, in basketball practice, I just want to talk about practice. Um, we, we had a lot of success within our practices. Our coaches will develop cohort groups. So, for example, it, uh, they say there's 15 uh, boys uh, on the team, um, myself and Jim McHugh, would be partners pretty much the whole entire year, and we would be assigned a basket. So we would, our, our two will be partners for shooting drills, for defensive sliding drills. So really a small little cohort might be me and Jim McKeel. And then another cohort might be, you know, John Dunn and Mark Mann at another basket. So this way you can track it, who's together for a period of time. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we've done a great job of developing small cohorts. Same thing, you know, in, in uh, indoor track, we'll have groups. So it'll be all the throwers, all the shot putters. Chris Diedrich's our uh, throw coach. So he would have boys and girls that throw the shot put together. That's a cohort group. Chris Osley does a lot of the jumping events, highlight a uh, high jump. So he would have that group as a cohort group. So it's easy to track those kids are together. Obviously in basketball, you're gonna be doing some scrimmaging. 
So you'll have an opportunity for those kids that will be together as a whole. When those kids are out of the game or not in the scrimmage or not in the drill, they're on the sideline six feet apart. Again, everybody has their mask on. Uh, I just want to quickly talk about uh, we do have ice hockey. It's a merger program with Shaker, uh, Averill Park County, and Tamarack. Um, right now, all five schools, as Mr. Simon says, are waiting and pending um, their DOH approval. Mr. Simons also mentioned that a few county health departments are all in that. So us in Able Park and Rensselaer County, uh, Shaker and County or Albany County. So that may impact ice hockey if you know Rensselaer County gets the green light and Albany County doesn't. So we may that may impact hockey. Hockey has their own set of rules. They show up to the rink ready to go and they carry their skates. Uh, 30 minutes before their practice, they change in the skates and they get on the ice. The nice thing about hockey is a lot of equipment total face, all padding. So there's a lot of protective, not a, and there's also internal face shield. And a lot of them now wear a mask, which they've been doing now for ice hockey inside. So that's also another protective with ice hockey. Um, let me quickly talk about, uh, like I cheerleading. Um, all these practices will be uh, spread out for our district using Columbia, Goth, and Green Meadow. Our cheerleading program traditionally has been at Green Meadow. They'll continue to be at Green Meadow. Um, they'll probably go 4 to 7, 7.30. The JV team will practice. The JV team or JV coach and the varsity coach will clean the cheerleading mat and then the varsity team. Um, same thing. It's a small cohort. It's that group. All cheerleading competitions are virtual. There'll be you know, Hopefully, there'll be four Saturdays. And the uh, county uh, is our league uh, chairperson. And uh, Saturdays, we'll do a virtual uh, cheerleading meet. And the three judges will actually watch our, our uh, live competition from Green Meadow. And they'll judge it. And some of those things have been going on for quite some time. Um, again, uh, indoor track, when it's nice out and it hasn't been too bad of a uh, winter, we're outside just like we were in the fall with cross country. We're outside, we're socially distant, masks are up. Uh, the track has been cleared, you know, except for today, but for the most part, we'd be outside a lot. If they're inside, it's small cohorts. Like I said, with like the throwers, there'd only be like 20 in that group and 20 in the high jump. That's all that would be in the gym. And maybe a, another group might be up in the, uh, the uh, sunshine hallway running. So they're all different groups. The whole track team's never coming together unless they're outside, socially distant, uh, and we can do that. Wrestling, there's a lot of different challenges to wrestling, and I thought we did a great job in this diagram coming up with a lot of different things. Obviously, with wrestling, it's very difficult to avoid the physical contact as well as wearing a mask. But within wrestling uh, practice room, um, you would have same thing like training partners. You would have one or two training partners, those partners were the only ones you'd be training the whole entire year. Then within our, our wrestling room, we normally have, it's called wrestling circles. Um, you know, it's part of wrestling. So what you would do is just um, spread them out. You would have uh, two to three guys at one circle, skip a circle, two to three guys so they're socially distant. So again, small cohort group in wrestling. One thing I want to bring up is that not a lot of uh, a lot of schools are on the fence with wrestling, and a lot of schools feel that uh, a weekly testing is mandatory for participation in the sport of wrestling. I'm not really sure about our capability of testing, um, in who would test it. Um, they uh, the the big wrestling guys in our league that are athletic directors thought the morning of a match they would be tested. Uh, it's a quick, uh, uh, rapid test they would take. Uh, to determine if a positive result comes out or not. Um, so those are some things about wrestling. Uh, but we've, like I said, uh, we've been meeting since Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all, all the time, uh, just trying to come up with a, a great document, working document, that all the schools and all of our student athletes be on the same page, the same expectations. And I think that's uh, very important that everybody is doing the same thing and the, and, and the uh, standard is the same thing.
I'm not sure uh, if anybody has any questions or Mr. Simes, you need me to cover anything else? One of, the things, one of the things I just want to emphasize is going back to the fall, as we talked with other districts outside the Suburban Council, we were reminded of how good the Suburban Council, what, good, what a good a job they did. They had the same standards for uh, both teams in place at every contest, and it was very consistent. That was not necessarily the case in some of the other leagues. Uh, so I was, we were really proud of that. I guess, I, Mike, I'd just like to open up an opportunity for anybody on the board to express their questions or concerns right now, and we'll do our best to try to answer them. Okay. okay. Uh, feedback from board members? Kathleen? Um, I kind of hate to be the, the, the wet blanket here, but there was a news story on just at 6 o'clock that Albany County has said that their schools will not be participating in the high-risk sports. Um, they have chosen to follow CDC guidelines, which wants your infection rate below 4%, and in Albany County, it's still above 6 So I don't know. I, I feel so bad because obviously a lot of work and a lot of thought has gone into this, so I don't know if there's any wiggle room with the counties. I, like I said, that's just what I heard at 6 o'clock. At our meeting, at our meeting this afternoon, we were told by Rensselaer County that that 4% index was being advocated for by some of the other counties and that our county was not in agreement with that. So um, we were also advised that they, were, they would be working together to try to resolve their differences regarding that and that we would expect perhaps to hear more information by Saturday. Uh, so what you're, what's being reported is inconsistent with what we said. I'm not, I'm not, I believe it's probably true, but, um, again, that would, if that is the case, that would affect, uh, Gilderland's participation, Albany city schools participation, Shaker high school, North Colonies participation and South Colonies participation and Bethlehem's participation. And CBA. So and CBA, so those are six schools that, if what's being reported is accurate, uh, would not be able to participate in the Suburban Council. One thing that has been discussed uh, is um, could you operate a league or an organization of some kind with the teams that are in the counties that do approve it? Uh, and there's a real question about whether or not districts should do that, whether boards would support us operating differently than other districts, and um, it's still an open question. So, so for example, Troy, Averill Park, and East Greenbush are all in Rensselaer County. If Rensselaer County decided that they supported the operation of sports and they weren't applying a 4% infection rate threshold, could we do something with Troy and um, Averill Park? Um, and I don't, I don't honestly haven't fully formulated my own views on that. And um, you know that that would allow the kids to participate to some degree. Nor do their superintendents know how their boards feel about that as well. So, yeah. but we've talked about the concept, <clears throat> but not in any kind of detail. We were hoping that our county health departments could work together to come to consensus, and it's disappointing, quite frankly, that they can't. Just to jump back in, um, if we're supposed to start this Monday the 1st, and it was going to be a six-week season. So basically, um, everything except wrestling needs six practices. Wrestling needs 10 practices. So basically, um, they're going to practice for about a week, and we're going to start. We, had a, we started working on schedules last night and today. Um, trying to get, you know, 11, 12 games um, for everybody. Another big question was spectators. Um, we felt as athletic, a group of athletic directors, we were going to start with no spectators because it's inside, and we really wanted to get everything going first to uh, ensure safety, to troubleshoot, and then um, phase spectators in, similar to, uh, like, you know, two, two guests per player. Um, socially distant contact trace as they come in the door, sign seating, you know, but to do that right away, uh, we're going to get, you know, the games going. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts in a game. 
And so uh, we wanted to kind of hopefully phase in spectators. Prior to phasing in, we would definitely honor and have a senior night. I think that's important. Um, we would have two guests per player, similar to what we did last spring. I did a senior night, even though we didn't have spring sports, um, and it worked out great. Uh, but I, would, I think that's very important to do that. So say you had four uh, boys that were seniors on the basketball team. I would have eight parents socially distant on the other side in chairs wearing masks, you know, to, to do that honor. I think that's important. Mark, anything? I saw something pop up on your screen, Mark. Yep. I got a question. Sure. Uh, I have two questions. One is, so if Rensselaer County doesn't give us approval, today's Wednesday, we got Thursday, Friday, then the weekend, we can't start anything February 1st, correct? Correct. Right. Correct. And, and secondly, great plan, Mike, a lot of effort. I appreciate it. <clears throat> I'd like to hear from um, Paul Bickle on, you know, what is the procedures for cleaning? It's one thing to go wipe down a classroom. You know, now you're talking a large gymnasium and the large wrestling rooms. Do, have we addressed those? Um, is that going to involve some extra people? You know, if what time do these sports end? You know, are we going to have to bring in additional people to work late to to disinfect them rooms? Can you guys? Can everybody hear? Yeah, I think. Yes. I think Paul's oh. out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you, Paul. A little, little. Um, Sorry. Speak up, um, Mark. To answer your question, I've been working with. Uh, Jim Van Buren at the high school. We're looking into um, options, how we're going to go about this. Um, right now, we've got typically there's a night per, or two night people that work the third shift. One of them is pulled up on to the 3 30 to midnight shift right now. So we're talking about putting him back to the night shift, um, the overnight shift, to help with the cleaning and disinfecting at the high school. And um, that we're also going to um, put another gentleman who works on, who's working Monday through Friday right now. And, um, during a normal situation, he actually worked on a Tuesday through Saturday shift. So we're going to end up putting him back on that shift, um, bringing a substitute in to cover on Mondays for him. And we're actually doing a little bit better on substitutes right now. So um, we're still kind of playing out the, you know, how we're going to do it exactly. Um, kind of waiting for ath athletics plan um, before we react totally. We need to know, you know, when end times will be for sports so that we can, you know, make sure we have the right amount of time built in for, for the cleaning and disinfecting. So, we are we are looking into it and um, following closely and working with the athletics department to to make sure that things will be taken care of properly. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. So, for example, Mark, real quick to answer your question, um, the chairs uh, in the basketball for a game, the JV might play. Uh, last time, Sean Leggett and we had one of my supervisors. We sprayed down the chairs, cleaned them. And then the varsity came in uh, after the game, you know, Sean Leggett and one of my game supervisors did it. It worked out extremely well. Um, a lot of other schools are using, I think it's called the, I don't know, the fogger, I guess. I'm not yeah. sure if that's the right word um, to clean wrestling rooms, weight rooms. Uh, if you use bleachers, um, you know, basketball courts, they just drive the machine, which they do now. The big, you know, looks like a golf cart, but it's a, it does mopping. It's like a squeegee. You know, he was just down the hallway right now. You would just do that in the basketball court, too. And that helps with a disinfected solution. Yeah, and one, one more thing, if I can just interject. We are in a much better place right now as far as actually having the chemicals we need to, dis to disinfect and having the tools to do it. Um, when we made that large purchase of the, the misters in the fall, those. Um, Originally, we only had one of those in the district, and it was at the high school, and it was used mainly for athletics because 
they work great. You can walk into a room and literally just mist everything and disinfect it. Uh, you know, so the, those, now that we have the capacity with those plus the people that we need, I, I don't think it's going to be any issue taking care of the, the bigger spaces for, for sports if they do end up opening up. And then by utilizing Green Meadow, Columbia, and Goff, um, and with less levels, the only levels we're looking at having to really do it is varsity and JV for boys and girls basketball and cheerleading. Wrestling would be at uh, a varsity level. And uh, indoor track, basically a varsity JV, and they'll, they'll do virtual meets as well. Uh, Gillen and Shen have already started some virtual indoor, uh, indoor track meets. Um, you know, if the track is nice, the weather's nice, they go out and do some hurdles, some sprinting. They time their guys and they kind of compare scores. That's what we do right now with bowling. It's all virtual. So we have a bowling match. And then our coach takes our scores and calls up the shaker coach. And they compare scores to who, who's first, second, third, and who won the bowling match. So we did that. Uh, we do that now with swimming. We did that um, in the fall with swimming. And uh, with cross country, we staggered it. They didn't run against other schools cross country. Our team ran, uh, and then the other team ran in cohorts. And we just merged the scores and find out, you know, first, second, third, so on and so forth. Thanks, Mike. Any other questions for for Mike or? Uh... Jeff, Michelle, go ahead, Michelle. So, so two questions. Um, first is, do we have any concerns that we're crossing over cohorts, meaning we got the high schoolers going to the elementary school or middle school to practice? Is are we are we nervous about that? Should we try to keep them separated and the high schoolers with the high school? I know we don't might not have room at Columbia, but I don't know if that causes more risk that we might be contaminating an elementary school. Um, and then second of all, and don't shoot me on this, but is there a possibility that we consider testing these kids or mandated testing uh, the participants weekly, or is that not allowed? I'll answer the second question about testing first, and then I'll let Mike talk about the coordination of the schedule and whether or not the kids would be, yes, they'd be using the space, but they wouldn't necessarily be in the building at the same time. The um, the issue of testing has been discussed both within our Questar superintendents group as well as among the suburban council superintendents. The type of testing that we're approved to do right now through Questar BOCES is uh, specifically licensed to uh, respond to a designation that we are in a yellow, orange, or red zone and not approved for use um, for. Um, for um, surveillance testing, or, or uh, and we've been trying to navigate through that through Craig Hansen to get some clarity as to how we might be able to use this supply of tests that we've we've uh, procured and um, whether or not it makes sense to do that uh, on some intermittent basis or random basis as far as uh, sports are concerned. Uh, some districts feel strongly that we shouldn't do it. Uh, some feel that it, it's a good idea. Uh, I think it's a good idea if it helps uh, facilitate the engagement of the kids, but we don't have clear direction on or guidance on how we would do that. I raised that issue with the County Health Department Director today. Uh, I Testing was one of the areas that we were told was going to be explored and talked about as a potential option between the counties. And again, that was a meeting at noon this, at noon this morning. So uh, I'm open to some type of testing if we can do it based on uh, health department guidance. And obviously if it enables the kids to play, because I'd like to see the kids playing. As far as scheduling and intermixing with the elementary and middle school levels, Typically, we do have practices after the elementary kids are dismissed. Correct, Mike? Yeah, so Michelle, to answer your question, for example, at Green Meadow, earliest that cheerleading would start at be 4 o'clock. So we, but we won't have time, Mike, to clean the gym to get them ready for it, or is that will that already be done? I'm just worried about the timing of all the cleaning. Um, I, I think 
they're just going to go to the gym, and I'll, I'm not worried about the contamination. They're going to go in, roll the, roll out their cheerleading mats. No one else is going to be using them. The elementary school is not going to be using them, and uh, they'll use their cheerleading mat. And then after the JV practice, they're going to get wiped down. The coaches can do that or spray down. And then after the varsity, they'll spray it down again because you want to put it away dirty. And then they'll roll it up, roll it up and place it against the, um, the wall. If they would use the uh, the team would only use because you can't have you know six people going to the bathroom. They would use the bathroom that's kind of near Coach D's office. Mm -hmm. That would be the designated uh, bathroom for cheerleaders. So this way, it's not down around the uh, cafeteria where you know little kids might have been, or maybe you know I don't know if GCC is even there, but um, it would be very distant and very spread out, and they would have a designated bathroom. Uh, and then this way, at the end of the night. Uh, custodian or maintenance can clean that bathroom. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. One of my concerns about testing is would we be able to get more tests if we run out of the supply that we ordered for the, you know, the eventual required testing that we were anticipating? I would want to know that we could be uh, given sufficient number of, of tests and uh, to make it, to make it sustainable. And, and some parents may not want to have their kid tested, but you know, if it was up to me and I could have sports on if I got them tested, by all means, test them. The concept we talked about was taking the student athletes who are already in the pool of families who consented to the test, yeah. clarifying with the families that they want to, uh, that we can go ahead and do it, and then um, moving forward on it. Again, it's, it's having the approval to do it, and having sufficient supply of the tests to do it, and how do you do it with direction from the county in a way that it has some validity to it um, were, were my questions. But uh, yeah, we're we're on uh, we're not opposed. I'm not personally opposed to that. And I think a lot to remember is this: this only came out Friday evening, as Mr. Leonard said, and we're. We're going to get more information and guidance because there's a lot of districts across the state that are asking the same questions. I, I do want to echo what Mark said about thanking the team for all the work that's been done. I think the section will help out with this. I know that um, it really, the, the guidance has given the authority to the local health departments, the county health departments. And without those written guidance, you know, I'm all for proceeding based on the success we've had. And, but without those, approvals in place we're not doing anything i mean i think that has to be clear to the community unfortunately that you know they they have now the authority to decide what how we move forward our job is to plan prep and be ready for when that happens and um so we can give our student athletes families an opportunity to to participate uh as mike has outlined here and and i think the district has done uh, a terrific job in the fall as you mentioned um tonight about being successful with our sports programs um, so far this year. And, you know, just thinking back throughout graduation, all the different things we've done, we are, number one is always going to be the safety of our students and our families. And we can make those things happen. We just have to make sure that the, uh, the people who can give us the okay, give us the formal okay, and, and we can proceed um, under that because we don't want to put anybody else in jeopardy either. But it's going to take a lot of cooperation. Definitely. Is there any other views that would be expressed, John? I just wanted to make a comment that um, I am supportive of this concept of trying to bring back some normalcy to these kids um, and giving them opportunities to be active because um, yep. unfortunately, uh, during this pandemic, you're, everybody's becoming complacent and lethargic. So uh, thanks to Mike and Paul and everyone to put this together. Again, we have to just uh, be mindful that we're here to support the entire um, education and experience for the students in a safe manner. So I am supportive of exploring this further. And another comment I want to make, and I think that it's important to make a distinction, school districts as a public agency, a public entity have a, we are held to a higher standard. I know that there are other club, other sports are happening out there. We know that, but they're not under our jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction, um, our oversight comes from the state, 
in the local health departments and, and then, you know, we have to follow the guidance and the, the, that we are given. And uh, as much as that is difficult, when we know that other sports are happening in rec in other areas, um, outside the school jurisdiction, um, we still have an opportunity, uh, uh, we're duty bound to do the right thing by, by the guidance. So it's a, it's a conflict I know for a lot of families who, who wanna do this, but uh, we'll proceed as best we can uh, once we have clearance and approval. And, and the superintendent and the board is satisfied that all the approvals have been met. Thank you, Mike. That, that's somewhat up for folks, all right? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Appreciate all the work, Mike. Stay at it. I'm sure things will change, and uh, you'll, you'll brief us again uh, as things happen. Yes, thank you. Before I leave, I just want to let you know one of our uh, former athletes, Selena Lott, scored her 1,000 points at Marquette, becoming the 30th in school history. And that's an unbelievable accomplishment by Selena. It's unbelievable. And, and, and Marquette's... Uh, history she's the only the 30th girls basketball player to score a thousand points at college so thank you everybody and by all means if anybody has any questions please let me know have a great night thank you michael you're right okay anything else uh mr simons uh, no i i will reserve any <laughs> other comments about reopening and the school operation for uh, maybe the second round. Okay, second round. Okay, so that uh, <laughs> took quite a lot of time. It was an important topic to our community, our, our sports folks. And, you know, one thing I, I had to also say is that when they open up sports, high-risk sports like this to potentially playing, our folks who do the arts and music, you know, we feel for you too because I think that is also something that has to be addressed with the guidance to allow not just student athletes but also – our artists, our musicians, and clubs to be able to do some of these things too, because um, those those things that they do are just as important as our athletics. And, and this district has always shown that we're a huge supporter of the arts here at the district, and music programs, and other clubs, and um, as well as athletics. So it's a it's for everybody. Thank you for saying that, Mike. I know some districts have expressed this concern about consistency of the criteria that's being applied to sports and music. I, I will say that our music department has done a wonderful job trying to find a way to have band, orchestra, and chorus this year. And if you come to the high school, which we are limiting visitors, but I, they let me in uh, <laughs> in the morning. You, and you go down to the cafeteria, our band kids are practicing 12 feet apart with their music stand and their instruments. Then you walk down to the auditorium and our choral groups are spread out in the auditorium and they're singing with their masks on. And then you walk around the corner and you go down to the, uh, some of the music rooms and our strings kids are playing. And it's, yeah, it's really great. nice. So we, they found a way. <laughs> and over the holidays, they presented the community with a virtual yep, yep. performance. And so they're doing a great job. That's great. Yeah, it's always encouraging. So we'll now move to uh, a couple other topics is the discussion items. So we're going to move to the 21-22 budget discussion. So we're, we're moving, actually we're not moving into, we are in budget season. And at this point, the governor has released to the residents of the state of New York his executive governor, uh, governor's proposal for the budget for next year, which includes the portions of the budget related to state school aid. And um, that information uh, was provided to us from our elected legislators, and we began to do a review of it to determine what the state is proposing at this point in the budget process for our revenues, which is relying very heavily on an assumption that a large amount of federal aid will flow into the state, which will be distributed uh, through a formula to the schools. Uh, Linda Wagger, who is our Director of Business and Finance, has uh, worked to review the data on uh, the projected state aid for our schools. Uh, she has also worked with Questar, which has a statewide department called State Aid Planning that helps us to understand our state aid scenario. So I'm gonna turn it over to Linda to talk about the state aid analysis and then we'll kind of jump back and forth. Okay, thank you, Mr. Simons. 
so I wanted to provide the board tonight some general and very preliminary information on a few different topics. One is the, con uh, the governor's executive budget and then how that pertains to our district as well as I wanted to uh, just give some general information on where we are with health insurance rates, BOCES rates, um, a review of the budget request items, and just an update on the enrollment projection. So Mr. Goodwin, if you could pull up the file under budget discussion, that's called New York State Budget for School Aid Comparison. Pardon me? No, nope, that was fine. He's got to share the screen. Okay. There we go. Great, thank you. Okay, this is a um, an overview of the executive budget as it pertains to school aid and education. And there's a there's a couple of items that I just want to point out to you. The governor prepared this budget with an assumption of a $6 billion in federal aid. Um, that is not a guarantee at this point, um, but he felt it was a strong assumption. He is, however, asking the federal government for $15 billion for New York State. But this budget was prepared with $6 billion in mind. Um, another item that he in that first section there that you're seeing on top where it says total state funded school aid, that includes that $6 billion that I was referring to. Another um, item in here is foundation aid. That is the largest part of our general aid that we receive. And that is uh, staying the same as it is in the 2021 school year, which is also the same as it was in the 1920 school year. So that is a three year flat rate. Another item that the uh, governor proposed was taking a series of aid categories and summarizing them into a category called services aid. And if you look, um, the categories include BOCES aid, transportation aid, instructional material aids, those are the main categories in our um, in our district that will be consolidated into the services aid category. If we could stay on that first sheet, Peter, that'd be great. And I'll tell you when to um, move up. And um, so if you look at that in the 2021 proposal, it's $3.7 billion. But next year, he is projecting $3.3 billion. So he's consolidating those aids and it is being decreased. And it's interesting how it falls um, with, our, uh, with our district, which we'll discuss in a minute. Another item that he put into his budget this year, which has not been included in prior years, is the STAR reimbursement. So there are two types of STAR. One is a credit, and that is where a home, a home owner pays the taxes and then receives a check back from the government. And the other, which applies to us, is an exemption on a, on a homeowner's taxes. So therefore, the, ta the homeowner pays less in taxes, and then the state makes the district whole with the STAR aid. And that has never been included as state aid. We always include that as part of our taxes. So that is um, something to consider. And he is also um, reflecting a negative uh, funding adjustment against that. And then very importantly at the bottom there is a COVID-19 Supplemental Stimulus Act. And that is $3.8 billion that uh, he has included in the budget. That is a second source of federal revenue. And that is the money that was approved, um, approved by the president in December. So of that allocation, that total allocation federal wide, uh, New York State is receiving a, a certain amount, about $4 billion, and $3.8 billion of that is plugged into the state aid projections. Um, that's a concern not only for next year, 
uh, because that is not supplemental revenue to us. Um, but it's a concern for the years after that because if the state doesn't have that federal money in the 22-23 school year um, coming from the federal government, it's got to come from somewhere. So it will come either in the form, it will come most likely in the form of reductions in state aid. So that's something for us to keep in mind that this pandemic has not only affected this year, next year, but the following year. If we could move on to the next sheet there, Peter, Mr. Goodwin. Um, what I did is I took um, the governor's budget is then spread out over the districts and we receive state aid fund, uh, state aid runs. And I took our state aid run and I compared I compared it a side by side comparison. Uh, for this current year versus projected for next year. Uh, when we receive the runs, it's, it's in a vertical format, but I thought this would be easier to take a look at. So as I said, the foundation aid is staying static at 17.1 million. The services aid, in our case, is projected to increase, and I'm gonna go over what makes up that um, aid in a little bit and why I'm concerned about it. If you go down a little bit farther, you can see our star payment. Our star payment uh, this year was one four point, almost 4.2 million. It's projected to be 4 million next year. So that alone is a decrease in the star program that I spoke about. He also um, included in that area the local district funding adjustment of 3.9 million. So that 3.9 million adjustment is East Greenbush District's portion of that 3.8 billion that I referred to on the previous page. Um, so he's, he's actually reducing that from the star payment. So there's some question right now, and, and the state aid planners are actually in, in contact with our legislators trying to figure out exactly how that adjustment will be taken. Um, will we receive that in less STAR aid, which will affect our ability to tax? Um, or will it be a deduct from our regular state aid? So um, the next sheet there, Peter. I looked at our, I referred to the services aid so in our current year, the combination of those aids is 5.9 million. It's projected next, next year at 7.1 million. Um, so I was concerned about that because those projections seemed high to me. And um, I looked at our BOCES aid is projected to increase 300,000. Our transportation aid, 900,000. And these numbers seem artificially high to me. So those numbers, I, I talked with the state aid planners, those numbers are projections. And the truth is those number, those payments will be made based on our expenditures for this year. Our aid ratios went up slightly. Uh, transportation aid went from 65.2, it's projected at 66% next year. But that does not account for that large increase in transportation aid. So I just caution everyone that these are very preliminary and most likely will be changing. That is what I had, that was just a general overview of what we know so far about the um, state aid. Now I can go on to the other topics or we can stop there and I can answer some questions. Why don't we do that, Linda? Why don't we see if there's any questions about state aid okay. before we go any further? Since we're screen sharing, I can't see anybody. So if you want to talk, you can go ahead and. Uh, there we go. Ask a question. I don't see any questions. Okay. 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 Very good. Anybody here? Okay. All right. Um, complicated so subject. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And again, I just want to say this is the executive proposal. Yes, it's this the executive. This is not the final proposal. I mean, right, the you know, three men in a room kind of thing different. has to happen too, right? So, right. Mm -hmm. That was the old school way. So the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about was health insurance rates. Uh, that's a large part of our budget is our health insurance expense. 
Um, right now, we are in conversations with Amsher, our insurance agent. Um, there are slight increases in the premium rates for our Blue Shield plans. I don't know the increase in rates for the CDPHP plans yet. Um, but what we are looking at is trying to use some of the reserve money that we have with Kashik, our health insurance consortium. Uh, we have reserves on file with them, and we will be talking with them about using some of those reserves so that we can um, keep our health insurance rates in check, <laughs> basically. So there'll be more information to come on that, and we expect that I'll be able to have um, final rates probably towards the end of February. Yeah. Uh, the next item is BOCES rates. I'm just gonna give a quick overview on that because I see we have a further presentation on that. Um, the BOCES rates look very good this year. There are three components to the rates, the administration, the rent and capital, and then the services. The administration and the rent and capital sections have a 0% increase this year. Um, the services rates, um, that consists of all of the programs that we sign up for, many of the instructional programs that we sign up for with BOCES. And 94% um, of those programs have a less than or equal to 2% increase. So those rate increases are, uh, are very acceptable and we'll be going into some further information on that. The next item I wanted to talk about was the budget request items, and Mr. Goodwin, there is a, a spreadsheet on that, if you could pull that up. So over the last month to month and a half, I met with all of the building administrators, department heads, supervisors, directors. And we, um, we talked about items that are important to them in this next budget. And we also spoke about the fact that we are in a pandemic and we are facing a financial um, financial crisis. So. Um, we have decided that in this next budget, our main priority will be focused on academic intervention services. Uh, so as we went through this, um, I tried to categorize all of these requests into a priority A, B, or C. So basically, all of the AIS requests, I'm putting those in a column in priority A, which is in the items in blue. Um, and the reason I did that, that's not saying that these items are going in, it's just saying that these items are of the top priority of the requests we received. And these, all of these requests are subject to budget, our state aid, how our revenue is coming out, and our enrollment review. So a couple of the items I wanted to point out, um, you know, most of the elementary buildings are looking for an additional 0.5 AIS teacher. And I calculated those salaries based on, um, I used step three of the um, salary schedule for 21-22. And I did that because we don't always bring all of our teachers in at step one, and sometimes they're a little bit higher than step three, they could be step five. So I used step three. I used the TRS expense percentage of 10%, FICA at 7.65%. On the non-instructional salaries, I used an ERS percentage of 16.2%, which I do have that supporting documentation from ERS and TRS. And as far as the um, health insurance, I projected using family health insurance plans with a district share of 82%, so that would be an employee contribution of 18%. Um, so each of the elementaries have really um, requested an additional 0.5 AIS. Janae um, has requested a little bit more than that, but that was in light of we're looking at enrollment, and it appears that we have a large kindergarten uh, projection for enrollment. Um, it seems out of line with the other years. Um, so based on that, 
based on increased enrollment and also based on the fact that we've had some families leave the district when we reopened and they may be coming back next year. So that's why um, we're talking about an extra, extra AIS teachers and possibly the need for um, extra grade level teachers as well. Uh, in the middle school, uh, their priority was the same thing, AIS. They are looking for additional help with AIS as well as um, additional help with homework clubs after school where the teachers are staying now for an hour twice a week helping students. We currently have four teachers doing that and they're requesting to increase that to six teachers. At the high school, we felt there may be a priority for increased APEX licenses uh, through our BOCES and we currently have 50 and we are are um, assuming that we could probably have a need for another 40. Under the curriculum instruction, we have um, the Savas, I, I think that's how you say it, Savas Envision um, program. This is a K-8 program uh, that we renew the subscription for every three years. So this is a three-year subscription. It is quite expensive, but um, what we're thinking is that we may need to take some of the uh, allocation that we've made to the buildings for textbooks and reclassify that to this district-wide code so that we can cover that expense. Um, I'm going to come back to technology. In the pupil personnel services department, they are requesting um, a few years ago, uh, when the responsibilities for registrar was moved over to that office, uh, it, it short-staffed the office by approximately a 0.5 typist. So we're looking to either restaff that office with a 0.5, reassign responsibilities from another typist position to that office, or possibly there is a power school online, which is the most expensive option and something that we may need to consider in a future year. But what this would allow the registrar to do is it would allow families to register online and all of the documentation would be going back and forth through a secure um, online portal. In athletics, um, the 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 main priority is a coach for the girls' golf golf team. That uh, that sport has been growing over the last few years, and there is some difficulty in scheduling with the boys' golf team and the girls' golf team together. Um, and then there was also a request for some addi additional assistant coaching positions uh, by season. In operations and maintenance, Next year in the 21-22 school year, we are required to have a building condition survey completed, and that's estimated to be $50,000. The infrared radiant heating system is, there are three heating systems in the bus bay garage at the transportation center. All three of them have failed. Uh, two of them have been repaired this year, and the 44,000 is to repair the third one next year. There is also, um, as part of our replacement, vehicle replacement plan, uh, the need to replace a, a Ford F-150 pickup, we'd re be replacing a 2009 F-250 pickup. Um, and then there are a couple of other items that we, uh, a salt shed for storing salt, which um, we will discuss with the town of East Greenbush, sharing that service, as well as a platform, this platform super straddle, um, what that is, is that is when they have to change the light bulbs in the auditorium at the high school in Janae. At the high school, they actually have to unbolt all of those seats so that they can get a, um, a, a piece of equipment in there to get up and change those light bulbs. And so this would make it easier, but we are looking into the possibility of renting that from um, possibly uh, next door at the True Value. 
uh, the Human Resources Department, we are looking into, um, there is a need for additional clerical assistance during their peak times. And we are also looking into exploring a service for uh, investigations that need to be done. And um, that's very time consuming for that department. So we're just looking into that. Uh, in the transportation department, I listed there the replacement of eight buses, which that's part of our replacement plan. I did not put those in a priority category because that $736,000 is covered by the bus reserve that we have. And that bus reserve plan, we add in the state aid from, from the buses, bus purchases every year, and we try to add to that. So at the end of June 30th, 2020, we had over $900,000 in there. So those buses will be covered. The transportation department is uh, requesting to update their, trans their TransFinder program to a cloud-based program so that in the event of power outages, they would still have access to that. And that is $15,000. Those are the main, um, main requests that we had. And um, as I said, we're focusing our efforts on AIS, and uh, we definitely do need to renew the Envision license for the next three years. Linda did a nice job of summarizing everything and detailing everything in a really great organization uh, so that the board can see and the public can see what the requests are. One of the things I will reemphasize that Mrs. Wager said was that this is just a starting point and a preliminary review of what uh, our building administrators, directors, and supervisors have identified as requests. Um, there are aspects of the budget that go up automatically, such as the health insurance, salaries, and um, uh, benefits including retirement uh, projections that relate to TRS and ERS. So um, some of these requests are uh, dependent upon uh, where we go with revenues and where we go with uh, the tax cap, which is likely to be very low this year. That's correct. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I did not go back to the technology department, and I do want to go back to that okay. uh, for a minute because <laughs> we are having a needs assessment, um, and, and there's a lot of numbers there, so I did want to cover a couple of things. We are having um, uh, an assessment of the, our technology needs um, being done, which is just getting started by an outside firm. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. But in... Um, some items that we do need to think about are the replacement of the VMware systems. This year we replaced um, about $100,000 worth towards that system and there's another $35,000 that's needed for next year. We have um, also some contracts that have come as a result of the capital projects that we did. We have uh, maintenance contracts on the telephone, the PA system, um, and those those are are set. Um, they're approximately sixty thousand um, dollars. We are also requesting. There is a request for some additional professional development within the technology department. And then the line item there that I really wanted to talk to you about is the eight hundred forty thousand dollars. And what that is is that's for the replacement. We're in the third year of our Lighthouse program, our one-to-one -one Chromebook program. So that 840,000 represents 3,000 Chromebooks and licenses. The reason I haven't put it into a category is because we have smart schools money left to take care of this purchase. Uh, we have to submit the plan, which in February you'll be hearing about, and then there is a public comment period before we actually submit the application, which will be in March. Uh, but I don't know the time frame for the approval of that application, so I don't want to put $840,000 into the budget because I won't be able to estimate the revenue to go along with that until we know that there is a, um, an approved application. 
Are there any questions on that? Okay. And then the last category I just wanted to just brief you on is the enrollment projection. I just today received the draft report from CDRPC. I will be reviewing it this week. And we expect the final report to be issued next week, so I'll have that for the board the first week in February. Um, I do want to reiterate that they are still projecting a high kindergarten enrollment this year. Our kindergarten enrollment dates are set for February and March, so we'll know how that, how that comes out. Um, and we'll be able to give you updates on the progression of that. Thanks, Linda. Any, any questions, board members? No? Again, I want to reiterate what Jeff said. There's a ton of work going on here, Linda, breaking it out for the community and for the board to see really specifically kind of what what the needs are, what the, um, at the executive level, what kind of things that they're doing to support school districts or not. And then kind of what our role is going to be to take this information with once um, the team gets it to start working on our budget and what we need to do as a community to support um, our students and families, but also recognize that our taxpayers are have been stretched during this pandemic too. So it's going to be a very delicate balancing act for us to uh, to navigate. Anything else? No? Good. Thank you, Linda. That's all I have. All right. Moving on to the next discussion item, there was a Questar budget uh, review for 21-22. Linda mentioned the rates briefly. And just, she was happy with the rates, right? Linda just told all but one thing that I was going to say about it, so that was good. We'll save <laughs> some time. Linda, I appreciate you summarizing that. The only thing I would point out, and I would encourage the board and members of the community to really read the presentation. Uh, the the Questar Boshis is mindful of the uh, the component districts. Financial circumstances, as we just described, and has really done a good job of being as efficient as they can be with a zero increase, as was mentioned in the administrative budget, an average of two percent in some of the programs, uh, most of the programs. Um, it's a very tight budget for the Questar um, in terms of uh, not failing staff and uh, making some of the tough decisions that we're going to have to make. So I'm appreciative of that. Uh, but in the document. If you look through it, uh, about 43 pages in, um, there's information that helps to understand what our, what our responsibilities are within the component districts, which are 23 component districts in uh, Questar. Our enrollment in current technical education programs uh, offered by Questar and in Tech Valley High School, which is a specialized STEM program, operated at the CNSCE campus at UAlbany, has increased over the last uh, few years. And um, that is uh, due to uh, some changes in practice that have enabled more kids who may be able to pursue career and technical education, maybe have a career field interest uh, that, um, that uh, sparks them to enroll in a course at Questar. Uh, and um, changes in our registration process that offers the full complement of courses to students that A, maybe want to take them, and B, can fit them into their schedule. So the numbers are in the budget are reflective of more participation in Questar programs, as well as as our enrollment grows, which it is growing, our portion of the share of the overall expenses associated based on a formula called our WADA, is which is rated weighted average daily attendance um, we contribute uh, more being a larger district uh, in the in the BOCES and having uh, growing enrollment and it's uh, it's uh, a formula that is averaged over over a few years so um, our kids are doing well in the BOCES programs and um, the Questar is doing a good job of managing their costs. Any questions? I think the Arwada chart that starts in 09-10 and goes through 1920, which is on page 39, yep. 
if you get a chance to look at that, you can see how the district, I think it's, it's a testament to our community and our district that um, we've seen a trend where students and families are enrolling in our program in our district, whereas there's been significant dips um, throughout the region. And I think it just speaks to the quality of education in the community about people being attracted to live and work in our community and, and send their children to our schools. Right. So it's a positive trend. It's, um, it's good to see that, uh, you know, and with more families probably coming in in the future with some of the um, development of Regeneron and other industries, um, we'll probably see that increase. And we still want to offer a complement of services and programs to our, our community uh, to best educate and prepare our students for college and career. So good information. Thank you, Mike. Any other comments before moving on to discussion items? No. Okay, we'll move to committee reports. And Marissa, you're up first. Appendix D. Thank you. So our Appendix D committee met on Thursday, January 21st. And we started off the committee meeting by scheduling some future meeting dates through March of 2021. As of now, we are scheduled um, three meetings in February and an additional three in March. We have, so far, we have a draft um, evaluation tool ready, and we also have a draft application tool. And what we've been struggling on as a committee is the cost matrix. So what we've done during this most recent meeting was kind of look at it through a new lens. And Joanne had taken a close look at our matrix that we had been working on over the holiday break and um, recommended that perhaps we look at an hourly rate for the new cost structure. We've been very focused on trying to make Appendix C, which is our coaches, um, model Appendix D. Um, and it's really, it's been trying to put a, a square peg in a round hole and it's just not working. So uh, when Joanne had suggested that, our committee um, felt it was a good idea um, to look at all of our options, including one could be an hourly rate. Um, something similar perhaps to an intramural rate and um, we've also decided while looking at that hourly rate to see if we could potentially develop different tiers um, and look at commonalities between some of the Appendix D clubs and we could have potentially three tiers um, and each of those three tiers could be at, at a different rate depending on the club functions and activities. Um, we discussed several areas of exploration such as setting parameters so what would be the maximum cap on um, the highest number of earnings for that hourly rate um, how would we look at preparation time how would that be um, compensated and then how many times per year there is language in the contract that states that our appendix d advisors are paid two times a year so really looking at how would that hourly rate work at two times a year would we have to keep the pay slips and disperse, is there room for um, potential new language in the contract? Um, so that's where we've, we left it. It was really a good brainstorming session. So um, we will continue to update you on where um, these items go moving forward. And we will be hopefully putting together a cost matrix with some hourly figures and seeing where that goes. Thank you, Marissa. Anything you want to add, Joanne, as a participant? Um, I think that Marissa summed it up pretty well. Um, once you get into it, to look at it, it's a lot more complex than meets the eye. Um, to say just to set up a new matrix, there's so many different variables. And even just saying, you know, what about an hourly wait rate? There's so many different variables that need to be adjusted and shifted. Maybe we could do something like that. Maybe we should stick with something else. But there's just so many um, ambiguities that we need to really take the time and sit and go through it, plug numbers in, plug clubs in, really play with it to see what's going to work best um, once we actually set it into motion. Thank you, Joanne. Appreciate all your the team's work on the uh, the Appendix D. Any questions for Joanne or Marissa? Thank you. We'll move to Linda. Any committee reports? I don't have anything. You had plenty so far, haven't you? Thank you. Uh, 
Jim McHugh? No committee reports at this time. Thank you. I know you're on the agenda a little later too. Uh, Mr. Simons. Uh, yes, real quickly, the uh, advocacy committee, which was established last year to work with our community to um, address issues for public schools, including the state aid discussion that we've been talking about tonight, we met on January 22nd via Zoom, and we are um, discussing the idea of having another thought exchange forum with our community on or about February 11th, where in addition to giving the community an update regarding our school operations and COVID, talking about um, some of the financial issues uh, that uh, to make our community more aware and to hopefully follow that up with uh, some type of a virtual forum where we talk with our legislators as we did in a live forum last year about some of our challenges. And that would include our state legislators and our federal representatives. Uh, I'm going to ask Mrs. Curtin, a member of our board, uh, to talk a little bit about what the School Boards Association event is coming up. We've timed this uh, after uh, Mrs. Curtin attends uh, some of the activities going on at, sponsored by the New York State School Boards Association. Mrs. Curtin? Okay, on next Wednesday, February 3rd, there is going to be the um, I don't even remember the name of it now, but basically it's the advocacy component of the New York State School Boards Association, and they're going to be doing a whole presentation on the executive budget. I know I'm planning on attending. I believe Ms. Massey is also. And once we kind of listen to that, kind of get where the School Boards Association is going with what they feel the um, priorities are for advocacy, I think that will help give us some ideas of where the rest of the state's going. That doesn't mean we have to be in the same spot, but it at least gives us some ideas of where we can get some additional help from other people who are in a very similar situation as us. And I think, you know, the hardest thing this year is everybody needs money and we're going to be told there is none. So it's going to be an interesting year for advocacy all the way around, I think. <clears throat> Thank you, Mrs. Kurt. <clears throat> the other committee I want to report on, uh, which is a very important committee, is our Committee on Global Education. This committee uh, was formed last year uh, to address concerns regarding diversity, uh, to make sure that as a district we continue to offer an inclusive and supportive and accepting environment uh, that respects all students, all staff members, and all community members. Um, we have been meeting and discussing what we could do as a district to continue to address issues around race, ethnicity, discrimination, acceptance, and inclusion. The committee is broken into four subgroups. And each of those subgroups is chaired by a respective uh, administrator and or teacher. So we have family and community engagement, we have policies and procedures, we have teaching and learning, and we have professional development. And we've come up with some priority activities for this year that we want to continue to highlight to our community. Um, the Professional Development Committee will be sponsoring a book study for teachers and staff uh, with a book that is all about uh, racial justice, including transforming communities through mindfulness. There are four, five sessions set up for the book study uh, in March, April, and May. Uh, that book study is open to any of the committee members or anybody else who wants to join us, and we're in the process of registering people and ordering the book. Additionally, we um, want to develop an ambassador program in each school that would uh, reach out to new parents, students, and staff who are coming from outside the community, including those families that are coming maybe from outside the state or outside of our country, to formally welcome them and assist them at adjusting to a new school district and a new community and to help them navigate what resources are available within the community. 
We have a curriculum instruction committee that is looking at uh, formal research-based instruments that can be used to look at our curricular resources to ensure that we are mindful of any ethnic or racial bias within our instructional materials. And Mr. McHugh's Professional Development Committee is looking at ways that we can incorporate some training and professional development for all staff next year, including the inclusion of some of the uh, topics around diversity into our curriculum through summer curriculum projects. Recently, uh, we brought to the attention of our staff, and we sent this out, uh, there are workshops being sponsored by the Capital District Regional Partnership, including on culturally responsive practices, uh, there is a workshop on February 25th on family engagement, community and culture. On March 11th, Fundamentals of Equity, Exploring Equity and Cultural Responsiveness. And in April, 29th of April, what does it mean to be a culturally responsive educator? Those are free uh, professional development opportunities that we have brought to the attention of our staffs. So we're doing a lot of work in this area. We know that it is an important thing that we need to continue to emphasize, and our committee is very excited about the work we're doing. Excellent. Uh, all great activities. I appreciate the committee's work on that. Any questions for Mr. Simons on the committee work for uh, global education? Excellent. I wanted to go back about the advocacy. I know that the interim commissioner and the chancellor also did a letter, a public letter that went out. I think many of you maybe got it through um, your email from uh, SED, really supporting the fact that a lot of the governor's budget talked about these being one shots and, and and making sure that the impact on these things long term could be devastating for for school districts. So I thought it was very well. I mean, it's the first time I think I've seen SCD in a long time come out very strongly about advocating for schools um, in that way. So it was good to see that in terms of the the their responsiveness. Thank you, Mike. Yep. That concludes my report. Thanks, Mr. Simons. Moving on to the next topic is the uh, approval of draft minutes for January 13th. All members were present, either virtually or in person. Any changes, revisions to those minutes that need to be made? Seeing none, I need a, a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, Kathleen and then, uh, Jennifer, second. All those in favor? Approve. Moving to uh, regular business, approval of programs for resident children with disabilities. Any questions? I need a motion for to approve that. Joanne, second. Michelle, all those in favor? Approve. Moving to um, our goals objectives. We've had conversations about the goals objectives in recent meetings. This is uh, an opportunity for us to formalize those. Any final comments um, regarding the goals and objectives for 2020-2021. I had asked Mr. Simons to make sure that uh, also that we think about our planning processes in terms of continuing to look at uh, reopening at the elementary school in terms of more days in person, uh, all the activities that we put in place before the surge hit after the holidays and making sure that that's also you know at the forefront of our, our planning and thinking as we think about the goals for uh, for this remainder of the year. We have started to discuss that pro reestablishing that process of looking at some of the options that we were considering prior to the um, holiday increase in COVID cases. And Mr. McHugh and I are um, talking about how to meet with our principals and get that process started. Excellent. I know there's been a lot going on. I think that's important for our community, knowing that um, as we as we move past the surge of cases, that there'll be um, more efforts to help the district move into more elementary in-person instruction. So with that, I need a, if there's any questions or comments on the goals and objectives. Uh, seeing none, I need a motion to approve those. Mark, second, John, all those in favor? Approved, thank you everyone. Reports and presentations of the superintendent of schools. This is the graduation rate by subgroup. I believe uh, you're gonna introduce Mr. McHugh. I get to pass this off to assistant. <laughs> Uh, Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction, Mr. McHugh. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Jim. Peter can pull the slides up.
So um, you can go to that first slide, Peter. Thank you. So New York State Education Department collects the graduation data for approximately 200 students, 200,000 students per year. Uh, they look at over 700 public school districts and over 200 charter schools each year. So whenever you see the New York State data, that is what they are referring to. The data is reported by cohort group and how they describe the cohort group, it is, it is the year that the students, the graduating class entered grade nine for the first time. Uh, so last year's graduating class of 2020 was the cohort group of 2016. Uh, what's really important for us is that the graduation rates are now calculated for and we're responsible for not just the four-year graduation rate in June, but also that four-year graduation rate in August, the five-year graduation rate, and now the six-year graduation rate. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, each year we get our ESSA report on accountability and it was not a um, it was not an ESSA indicator that they held us accountable for this year, but they did give us the data on our six-year graduation rate. So, meaning a student that doesn't walk across that stage in June, we still have that responsibility to try to get them to graduate for two years after uh, their uh, classmates have graduated. So, we knew that our six-year graduation rate for our students that fall into the category of economically disadvantaged, we didn't show growth in that area. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more towards the end. Uh, 2020, we know it wasn't a typical school year. On March 16th, the executive order directed us to close no later than March 18th. There are subsequent executive orders that required schools to remain closed for the remainder of the school year. Um, you know, we, we lose sight of the fact that where we are today, uh, when we go back to last March, we got two days worth of notice uh, for our schools and for all of our teachers to shift instruction from in-person to completely remote. Uh, April 2020, the Education Department canceled the June and August Regents exams. On May 4th, the Board of Regents decreased regulatory changes for exemptions on the August 2020 Regents exams. Uh, and really what that meant was certain students were exempted, they were exempt from the Regents exam requirements, passing the four required, uh, plus the fifth of global. Parents had the option to decline the Regents exams exemption, so their child would remain in school if they so chose to do so. Uh, next slide, Peter. Um, but you could, you know, when we look at this cohort data, you could assume that the Regents exam exemptions were a factor in the increase in the graduation rate. However, uh, we cannot say to what extent. So New York State overall increased from 83.4% to 84.8%. Columbia High School was at 97%. It should be noted that we we're also 97% in 2019. So digging a little deeper, these exemptions, they impacted 16 of our students. 11 of those students happened to be students with a disability, and four of those students were sitting for the required regions for the first time. We took a deeper look into those 16 students. They were well prepared to take their exams. We were very confident that they would have done well on those exams if those were given. Uh, but the graduation rate increase, where you're seeing the largest increase in graduation rate are the high needs inner city, large city schools. So uh, there were more students in some of those subgroups that uh, really needed that exemption from the regents in order to graduate. So. In, in high needs areas, you saw a larger increase in the graduation rate. In low needs areas, such as East Greenbush, you saw uh, little to no change in that graduation rate. So why is this important? We're continually reviewing our data to assess and respond to the possible impact of the NYSED executive order. So it wasn't just a one year thing. It wasn't just an exemption from regents from last year. It has an impact on our current students, our seniors this year, our juniors this year, our sophomores this year, there could have been a pre prerequisite course, right, that had a regents attached to it, that they're now in a higher level course. So we are monitoring that impact. We look at our uh, course failures quarterly. Uh, we're looking at students uh, that are failing one subject, students that are failing more subjects, and we are trying to make sure that we have supports in place to support those students that might need that little extra um, uh, support. So next slide, Pete. 
So we look at our four-year graduation date, uh, rate by subgroup. This is all students. It's 96%. What that includes, it includes our students that may go and attend other programs in other schools. The next slide, Peter. Our students in Columbia High School, that was our 97% graduation rate. And you can see where we've been um, over the years from 2014 through 2020. Uh, next slide, Pete. We break it down by female students. Next slide. Male students. Next slide. Uh, and then by ethnicity. Next slide, Peter. Next one. Next one. And general education students and then students with disabilities. Uh, so we look at these cohorts. The next slide, Pete. Economically disadvantaged students. And you can go to the next slide, Pete. And then really, what are our next steps? We identify who our non-completers are. So we've gone back four years to really see who these students are that aren't graduating, that are dropping out. We try to build a student profile. Um, and that's been quite interesting to do. So in our 2013 cohort, six students uh, did not graduate 2014 it was eight students the 2015 cohort four and then last year's graduating class it was five students 10 males 13 females 10 of those 23 students uh, were students with disabilities we have seen an increase in emotional wellness issues so some of the students that did drop out somewhere along that line typically between seventh and tenth grade there were some emotional uh, wellness issues that really prevented that student from being successful. 14 of our students that did not graduate over the last four years, 61% of them fell into the category of economically disadvantaged. So we know that's a factor, that's a national statistic as well. Interestingly enough, um, we don't realize here in East Greenbush uh, the depth of challenges that some of our students face. We had three homeless students that didn't graduate over the last four years. Um, four of the 23 students were in very strong academic standing. So if you look just at their grades, they were straight A students, 90s, maybe an occasional 80 or a B, uh, but there were, there were four students that really had strong academic standing, but there was some other reason uh, why they were not able to graduate. Uh, 11 of the students, almost half of those students were students that transferred in and out of the district. So. Somewhere along the line, they transferred out of the district, they might have returned, or vice versa, they transferred into the district from another school district. Four students, and this is interesting to note, refused district recommended placement. So for instance, two of our students were placed in CTAP. The placement was appropriate because the grades were strong and the students were quite successful. And then the students either chose to homeschool or chose to try to return to the high school setting. Um, students might be placed in Parsons, a skills program, or the Rensselaer Ed Center. Um, but what we did note is that there were challenges and contributing factors on why these students didn't graduate. And it included, it wasn't just, it just wasn't a single challenge. It was sometimes a combination of multiple challenges, but those things in, in included homelessness, uh, placement in addiction and recovery programs, pregnancy, medical issues, and of course, chronic absenteeism. Um, so what are we doing? Um, you know, we, without our strong uh, special education and related services program, I, I would almost guarantee that our non-completers, our dropout numbers uh, would increase drastically. Uh, but it should be noted that our special education and related services is a program under review this year. Our alternative education program is under is scheduled to be under review next year. So those are things we're looking at. Um, and, um, you know, there is that increased accountability. So we're looking for those commonalities. We're looking for trends and we're looking for missed opportunities. Is there something that we're missing that we could be doing? Um, I know COVID-19 has been a tremendous challenge. But there are some students that have flourished in, in our remote learning. So uh, there may be some things that may be an appropriate alternative for some students moving forward. So um, 
that's that's that data. Are there any questions or comments? I appreciate your time. Thank you, Jim. So we'll stop sharing and the board has asked us never to rest on our laurels and the 97% graduation rate is a significant accomplishment, but we are now focusing on the dropout rate as Mr. McHugh, identifying those common indicators of those kids and bringing that information back to those program reviews and special ed and alt ed to see what we can do to fill those gaps for those kids that meet those yep. those challenges. So I appreciate the work that Mr. McHugh is doing, Definitely. not only on the presentation, but really going and, and taking a deep dive into the data kid by kid. Jim looked at the, the specific children over the last three years, three cohorts that dropped out, talked with principals and counselors and got, got a profile of those kids to learn what we could do or maybe what we missed to intervene uh, in the future. So I really appreciate that work, Jim. Yep, definitely. And the whole team in terms of supporting our families and students to get them over the finish line, so to speak, to get so they can be uh, have an opportunity once they leave Columbia High School. So thank you for all your work. Moving from graduation rates subgroup, uh, table motions. I don't have anything at this time. Old business, board members, any old business that uh, we didn't mention? No? No? Okay. Moving on to the consent agenda, items A through H. Any questions or comments for the team? No? All right. Anything you want to highlight, Mr. Simons? Uh, no, I think everything's pretty straightforward. Okay. I did see we had an appointment for the business office, which is good, right? Payroll yeah. specialist. Very good. Um, again, thanks for all the work. It's a, it's a difficult time to hire during this period, right, Marissa? And I uh, appreciate all your work to, on the impersonal side. Mike, can I quickly congratulate Wendy Hadley, Ben Kelvin, and yep. Maureen Kirsch on their upcoming retirements? When you look at the number of years, there's over 65 years of service to the children of East Greenbush, and it's yes. a remarkable amount of time and a remar remarkable amount of work. Yep. Great. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, hopefully, uh, towards the end of the school year, maybe we can do some uh, recognition activities yes. about some of our retirees and tenured folks like we usually do. Fingers crossed. But uh, thanks for mentioning that. And uh, those are some familiar names uh, across the district. So good luck in your retirement. Any other comments or questions? We need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Kathleen, Jennifer, all those in favor? Approved. Uh, new business, board members, any new business to bring to the attention of the admin? No? We do have an item for new business, proposal for technology department position. You want to speak to that, Mr. Simon? Uh, yes, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Goodwin, our director of technology. Um, the board is aware that prior to COVID, we, uh, we wanted to look at the capacity of our technology department. We have a very small technology department, and... Um, the relative number of people in the department and the position descriptions have been the same for many, many years. Um, and at that, during the same time period, particularly over the last four years, we've, uh, we've through the capital project, installed a new phone system that requires the technology department support, new security cameras and software that requires the technology department support the one-to-one -one program for Chromebooks uh, and the expansion of devices to the uh, teachers and the students uh, funded through smart schools and the um, the department under Peter's direction does an excellent job but it is stretched and that is probably the biggest understatement uh, that I've ever made so um, we are looking at a full review from the uh, Madison Oneida Regional Information Center of the capacity of the department, and they will bring back a report uh, by the end of the year. We've had some meetings this year uh, to get that, re that study back on track, including last week between Mr. Goodwin, myself, and Mr. McHugh. In the interim, we have a position that has been vacated, vacated through a resignation uh, of a net network technician, and uh, Mr. Goodman is reviewing the needs of his department, feels that a different type of position with a different 
description, different background, and different compensation level would support the department uh, capacity a little better. Uh, so, Mr. Goodwin, if you're ready and able not to operate the computer at the same time, can you give us a little bit of an overview of what we are proposing to do? Uh, we're looking to move forward on this if the board supports the concept. We recognize that this is not a good time to add costs, but we also uh, have really a capacity issue. We also think that this position may cut down on some of the overtime. Wayne? Excuse me, you, Peter? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, I'm here for every board meeting, and I've heard it again and again, you know, whenever we have an opening um, in, an, in our staff, that we should reevaluate the position. Uh, and so I've done a little bit of that um, for this particular position. The position primarily serves here at Columbia High School. Um, when you look at uh, the current situation uh, with the Chromebook one-to-one uh, -one program, uh, we've taken on uh, the added support of families and their Wi-Fi experiences at home. Uh, an increased demand, unprecedented level really, of Chromebook usage now. Um, and so the, the demands are uh, far different than they were just, you know, one or two years ago. Um, also try to consider, you know, the timeline. So realistically, you know, if our work with the, the MoRIC um, yielded, you know, a finding that we needed to add positions, realistically, the earliest we could do that would be July of 2022. So, uh, you know, looking at looking at the, the needs, the way things have increased, you know, I, I support the addition of a higher level technician uh, for this uh, particular location and also to build capacity within the department. We're trying to be the best that we can be. Um, and we have several key positions um, held by people who've been here uh, quite a long time and have done a great job. Um, and we need to make sure that they have uh, backup, they have support. So we can achieve both of those things uh, with this particular move. And it's my recommendation to the board that we uh, post for the educational technology specialist position, uh, which has a different level of uh, technical skill and experience associated with it, uh, rather than post the network technician position, which is currently vacant. Any questions? Now, Peter's behind the screen, so he can <laughs> the big screen where I'm looking at you guys. Sorry. Um, so is there, no, that's okay. Any questions for Peter? I think that, um, I, have, I assume, Marissa, you helped with the analysis of the position, and, and what about the recruiting for the position? So next steps, if the board supports this, um, I would go to the Rensselaer County Civil Service to see if there's an eligible list for this um, particular position. If there is, we would have to hire off of that list. Um, if not, um, we would move forward with posting the position as a provisional hire. What, the, what are, just an example, what are some of the qualifications, Peter, that the minimum quals that would be in this position versus the network technician that make it higher skill level? So um, the educational technologist um, has a higher level of experience okay. and the minimum qualifications are higher as well. Okay. Um, they're able to handle a wider variety of problems um, and uh, understand how they relate to the entire network um, that's, in, that's in play. Um, also uh, would be a person who would have the ability to perform as a backup for key positions that we have only one person in. Okay. Is that Wayne's title? The, the gentleman's okay. sitting right next to me, yes. Okay. Just, <laughs> Wayne just, uh, I thought so, I just wanted to yes. I think it's important, I mean, I think as um, those distinctions, I mean, I think that given the need, need for depth, it is a FTE neutral, it, it is pay higher, but if we're also, if it could be something that supports less, Overtime and Wayne's time um, for uh, backup seems like a, a logical way to go. So any comments, folks? It's also an SRP position. So the outgoing position was uh, represented by SRP. The new okay. position would be represented by SRP. So it's, it's okay. not, they're not losing any bargaining, bargaining unit, unit members. Okay, very good. 
Mike, do you know what the increase is from the current vacant position to what the new position would be salary wise? Any estimates, Marissa, on a typical year with this rate? I would have to get you that information. Okay. So I'm looking at the difference. I mean, I'm just looking at step one mark on the document. Um, bullet number two and bullet number three in the memo, Peter provided. Looks like it's about uh, twelve dollars on step one, and it's consistent throughout the uh, the schedule. Okay. Yeah, the hour. There's an hourly rate differential. Yeah. Of um, depending on what step the person is, is the current position. Go outgoing position is twenty four seventy five on step one. Uh, step eleven is thirty five dollars and five cents, and the new position uh, at comparable steps would be thirty six forty eight and forty seven fifty respectively. So, the hourly rate is higher. Uh, I don't know, Peter. Not to put you on the spot. Do you know what the estimated total salary per year would be? Uh, assume let's assume it's a step step one. I think uh, I think I could figure that out for you. I, I don't have it in front of me. Okay. Um, well, why don't we rather than why don't rather than guests, we'll provide that information as follow up to the board. Yep. Um, yep. I can work on that tomorrow. Okay. I just use a typical twenty eighty hours. Yeah. It's seventy five. Yep. I just think it is long overdue. Anyways. Yep. Okay. May Thank I support? You. Is anyone not support moving in that direction? Because it's going to take time to. There's a list posting, Michelle. So I, I support it as long as it's you know fiscally responsible that we're not a, an excessive amount of difference. I think Peter and his staff have picked up in a tremendous amount of work with all the remote, and I definitely would support it as long as we can financially handle it. Thank you. We'll put together the total uh, estimated salary and benefits of the new position, and we'll set that out tomorrow. Okay, very good. I want a couple things. I want in new business. I want to mention. Um, is there any more for the, on this this topic at all before I move quickly? No. Good. Mike, just yes. a comment. John. Um, again, um, I am uh, in support of this uh, moving. I think one of the things that we are, are recognizing as we've been vaulted into this, the technology end of it, that um, we have to be mindful of the support staff and, and balancing that because what's the point of having all the technology if we can't utilize it? And in the past, we've always buy these programs and then they never get used to capacity. So even though we might be spending a little money, we're actually going to be saving money if we can um, more efficiently use and provide service for our staff and students. So um, I think this is a good move. And if Peter could uh, let his staff know that we do recognize the tremendous effort that has been put onto them with very limited resources in these times. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. So just, just a couple of new business items. Um, Maybe Mr. McHugh, you can comment this to um, the request for a waiver by SCD to the feds about state assessments. You know, I mean, I think, you know, you sent the email out to the community for comment. Thoughts, Jim? You know, what I would say is that, um, you know, it's been a constant um, year of let's wait and see. A uh, tremendous amount of planning goes into the three through eight assessments. Yep. You did see one of the choices also included the regions. Um, it's a really fine line. Uh, we heard a lot back from uh, our uh, folks that, you know, we're here to serve. We've heard from our parents and our students that, you know, once they cancel those regions, the uh, student interest and effort dissipated quite a bit. Yep. Um, so, you know, there's that fine line. We, we really held our grading policies uh, and put them into full effect for this year. And, and we are uh, really focused in on the essential uh, standards and content and um, really pushing our kids. And so there's a fine line there. You know, they come out and make that announcement. You know, there, there's, there's going to be an impact. 
Um, however, when you look at that issue a little more globally, um, you know, we, t we take it for granted that we've been able to remain in this hybrid. We've been able to have two in-person days a week, and uh, there are districts that haven't had any in-person learning time right within the CAP region. Uh, you look at districts that have had multiple closures for weeks at a right. time. Uh, right. So, you know, that impacts everything. So when you're looking for equity, it's it's a it's an issue. I'm not sure if there's a, <laughs> a correct answer to, <laughs> to, to that. Yep. Thanks for that, uh, Mr. Simons. Yeah, the other the other issue is the state education department does not have a uh, computer based testing right. uh, program that has worked real well uh, on the scale that we would be required to do it. I mean, there have been uh, grade levels piloting it over the last few years, entire schools piloting it, but it hasn't really ever been tested uh, to do full capacity with all of the students mm -hmm. taking it at once and then they were we would worry about validity and reliability regarding the test results right so um, the other the other piece to it is um, the three through eight testing uh, would require the uh, the scheduling to be done very differently because if it can only be uh, done in person we'd have to have multiple test days more so than we do now at each grade level to bring the small groups of students in to take the test and that would be logistically difficult. Not impossible, but logistically difficult. Yep, yep. I understand the challenges, but I think what Mr. McHugh said too, the, the engagement level of our kids at the middle and high school level yeah. is, a, is a concern. We, we, we've done a lot to prepare our students. I just would like to make sure people weigh in on this issue. It's important. Um, critical because it does it, it's going to impact our kids some will breathe a sigh of relief but others will be pretty disappointed because they've been putting a ton of effort into our, our our work so far this year the other thing is um just on winter sports um you know we, we we may be needing a special meeting next week i think mr simons had mentioned that i just want to just put that out there that the board will try to meet again as soon as we have more information about winter sports and coaches and you know those kinds of things so we may have to revisit this issue as things progress and maybe have to have a special meeting next week to discuss some of those things so just want to put that on the radar and the committee's radar um, for the future okay with that we have public forum number two Ms. wager anything uh there's no no public comments. no public comments oh okay Board forum number two. I'll we'll start in the in-person folks. Deanna, you're good, Frank. He's good. Uh, on the big screen, Mr. Dunn, you're on my left. Thumbs up. Mark, man. Just the uh, policy committee. Jeff, we're still waiting on that uh, one policy from the end of last year, I believe. Are you talking about the residency policy and? Um, yeah. Uh, non-resident attendance yeah, uh, yes yes I have several sample policies that I want to review send out to the board and then I want to have a meeting uh, there are there are some that I gathered from New York State uh, School Boards Association some from other districts and uh, we knew I wanted to have a virtual meeting to review them and discuss them given the topic. So uh, it's still on my radar to do, and we will be doing it soon. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Jennifer? You good? Uh, my right, Michelle? Good. Joanne? Good. Kathleen? Good. I think everybody? I think so. One, two, three, four. Yep. And myself. I don't have anything. I think I've said enough tonight. So we do have need for an executive session uh, for purposes of update on collective bargaining and personnel. We will take five minutes. Peter's going to send the link to the board members. And I just want to thank everybody for the participation and the hard work that's going in. And uh, we'll have an update soon. So have a great night. And board members, we'll be back here um, in, in five. Hmm. Thank you.